Good morning. We're going to get started. If you want to grab your seats. Dr. Krukeberg. The benefit of working at Plymouth. I know who you are, even with your masks on. Uh, good morning again. It is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker this morning, Dr. Chris Wren. Dr. Wren received her PhD in higher education from Boston College and is currently Mildred B. Erickson Distinguished Chair and Professor of Higher Adult and Lifelong Education at Michigan State University, where she also serves as Associate Dean of Undergraduate Studies for Student Success Research and teaches graduate courses in student development, diversity and equity in education. I was just asking her backstage how she does all of this. It all integrates. You'll see it probably comes together in her talk. Prior to coming to Michigan State, she was Assistant Professor of Higher Education and Qualitative Research at Southern Illinois University Carbondale, a Policy Analyst for the Massachusetts Board of Higher Education, and a Dean in the Office of Student Life at Brown University, where she met and worked with a little unknown you may recognize as Robin DeRosa, Director of PSU's Open CoLab. Dr. Wren's research interests include student success and persistence, identity and identity development in higher education, mixed race college students, women in higher education in the U.S. and global contexts, and LGBTQ issues in higher education. She's co-PI in several grants related to increasing student success for low-income and underrepresented students. Dr. Wren's research into higher education ecosystems grabbed our attention as we were planning our University Day's focus on collaboration, a key factor in trait and cluster learning, and ideally our campus culture. In a recent co-authored article in Change, the magazine of higher learning titled, Is Metric-Centered Leadership Generating New Silos? Dr. Wren identified how the proliferation of silos in higher ed among administration, among different types of faculty, student affairs, student success services in particular, quote, make the need to create an institutional culture of collaboration both more difficult and increasingly critical to helping students succeed. Collaboration and coordination of faculty and professionals in each area support a holistic approach that engages students in and out of the classroom in the kinds of experiences that activate growth mindsets, encourage individual development, and provide support for challenges related to intellectual growth and institutional navigation, end quote. We all have our unique perspectives, responsibilities, values, and activities, Wren recognizes. Quote, by understanding and negotiating differences, we can promote greater student capacity and in turn promote student learning, development, and success. One of the key goals of clusters is to teach and model how collaboration across such silos can bring unique, integrated solutions to problems we all face, whether in our classes, our professional work, our personal lives, or as global citizens. Quote, for deep change to occur, Wren concludes, we need to articulate a shared vision for student success and goals for addressing key elements and work to assure buy-in from all levels of campus. This shared vision will require collaboration among the silos to become a new organizational reality, end quote. Hopefully, some of the sessions you'll be attending this week will spark more ideas on how we can all work together in our shared purpose to provide meaningful educational experiences for our students that prepare them for success and happiness post-university. We have a lot to learn from and with one another. In her talk for us this morning, Dr. Wren will present an, on ecological excuse me, will present an ecological systems model on campus efforts to bring together staff and faculty to promote student success, especially in relation to equity. Even though she's a Michigan State Spartan and I'm a Michigan Wolverine, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Dr. Chris Wren to Plymouth State University. Thank you. Didn't know she was a Wolverine until she just said that. Um, when I got my job at Michigan, so I'm from out east. My mom actually lives in Narragansett, Rhode Island, where Jim Cantori was standing on her block recently. She is fine um, after the hurricane. And um, so I got my job at Michigan State, and my family's like, are you going to the green one or the blue one? I was like, I think I'm going to the green one, and I think out there they care about these things. Um, so uh, however, my spouse is a University of Michigan alum, third generation, so uh, in our house we go blue and go green. 
So I'm really excited to be here today. Um, first, I want to thank um, President Burks and Provost McClellan for their introduction. I want to thank um, Robin DeRosa, who, in fact, we have known each other, we figured out since possibly 1991, maybe. Um, so some of you are adding that up on your driver's licenses and not getting to your own age. Um, others are thinking, oh, they, they're just hardly know each other. Um, so we could tell stories, but we're not going to, right? Um, so uh, I want to thank Robin, I want to thank her staff in the Open Collab, and particularly Hannah Hounsell, who was instrumental in getting me here. I also want to thank your meteorology faculty, who yesterday morning at 9 a.m., I mean, at the Detroit airport, texting with Robin, she's like, no, my meteorologist, and I've got good ones here, so you should be fine to get in and out. I was like, okay. Um, I also have to fess up that, of course, this is my first in-person anything um, in a very long time. So uh, Michigan State went remote on March 11th and stayed fully remote last year. Um, so it's really um, interesting to see faces without little names and pronouns next to them. I'm terrified of teaching my students again, um, who we taught all that way last year. I'm like, I, I uh, forget whether or not you have a mask on. I'm not going to recognize you. I was like, Katie, Sarah, Emily, you all are the same person to me without a little nameplate. So that'll be interesting. Um, so I'm really excited to talk to you today about uh, the campus ecosystem and how faculty and staff collaborate. So in my past, I have been a campus staff person. I am now both a faculty member and part of academic administration. Um, although most academic administrators still like to think of themselves as faculty, apparently other people don't see us that way. Um, so uh, we're gonna talk about sort of how this all works across. I do have notes with me in case, I was like, oh, I haven't done this in-person thing in a minute. So hmm, I might have to go back to my notes, but I think I should be, this We'll see how this goes. Um, I promise I'll do my best. So we're going to talk about how do we define student engagement and success. So student success often hits that last bullet point that we're just looking at the metrics, the four-year, the five-year, the six-year graduation rates. And that is often how our institutions are seen. It is a not unreasonable way to measure the success of an institution, honestly. Um, but it's not a great way to measure the success of students. So when I think about student success, I think about how do we engage them in educationally and developmentally meaningful activities? And we heard about some of those this morning, the kinds of things students are doing and they're moving in and the, the panel talked about several of those kinds of things. And then I think about learning, um, both as the AAC and U Association has defined learning, but other areas that you may designate as meaningful here on your campus. Um, I study student development, as uh, the provost said. I tend to study how students identify or build their identities, how they learn to interact with people, how they develop multicultural competence. So that's my particular interest, uh, civic engagement, those kinds of things. Ensuring students meet their goals. So if a student comes here to, um, you, you probably have some students who come here actually start with an intention to transfer out after a few years. If that's their goal, they meet their goal. It's not great for your metrics, but it meets their goal. Um, but many students will come here with the intent to, to finish a degree here, and that would be their goal. So I want to talk about equity and where we see the gaps in equity nationally. So we see access gaps. Who's going where? Um, racially, ethnically, uh, generation uh, of immigration to the United States, generation within college. We see some equity gaps in access. Who's going where? Um, we see differences in who stays. So persistence is a student staying. Um, we see difference in attainment, who's completing. And then latest census, the 2020 census data just out, have some interesting data on this that it was deep, deep, deep in several reports that I didn't get. It was out last Tuesday. I didn't have time to put it all into this presentation. But if you love the census data, you can go look at that. And then we see these gaps across race, race, ethnicity, income, all kinds of categories. So this is from the New York Times. Um, Fabian Pfeffer, who actually is at the University of Michigan, um, compiled these data. So on the left side, you see uh, students from the lowest wealth group, the lowest 40, it's 40% 40 was how he defined that. And this group has been increasingly attending college, uh, those born in the 1970s and those in the 1980s. Um, and they found that they are increasingly attending college, but actually the completion rate has barely moved from 11.3% to 11.8%. So if you are from the lowest 40% income quintile, um, just over one in 10 of those students will complete college or will have completed college. The middle wealth group, the, the next 40% up, um, has slightly increased the college going um, and has slightly increased college completion to about 32.5% or about one in three. So one in 10 of the lowest income, one in three of the middle income. The highest wealth group, this is the highest 20%, um, has actually decreased their college going. I don't have any explanation for that whatsoever, besides maybe trust funds, it's my best guess, but not really. But they have increased their completion rate. So the highest wealth group is now at about 60%. So six in 10 of these students are completing college. So we see that a lot of the efforts, I think, that we've done to increase college completion have worked really well for the wealthiest students. 
they have not worked as well for the rest. And it is not true that the rising tide has lifted all boats in that regard. We, we often in student success work like to say that, like, oh, we're going to target a program. It'll lift all boats, like everybody. It turns out it's lifting uh, the wealthy boats even wealthier, which means that higher education has become a key social uh, reproduction mechanism, uh, not as much social mobility, for concentrating wealth at the, at the top. This is a breakdown by race, and these are um, uh, U.S. adults 25 and older who have a bachelor's degree. So the highest line, the line at the top is Asian Americans, 53%, uh, whites, 36%. Uh, the next is uh, black Americans at 23%, and uh, Hispanic, that's the word they use in the New York Times, or Latinx folks are at 15%. Um, so they have all increased over time. This is great. It's, this one starts in 1964. Um, so they've all increased, marvelous. But again, we don't see the gaps closing, and we see the gaps widening. So these are some of the equity gaps and sort of what's going on. I wanted to pull some data for Plymouth State. So I went to your website and I had to go to IPEDS, which is the National Data Center for Higher Education to kind of put together some things. So on the left side, um, Plymouth State is the, the darker bar, the dark green bar. And this is for students who started in fall 2014, 58% of them graduated within six years. So that's not bad at all. The national average for publics is 61. I didn't get the, um, the, the t t complete peer group. So that's all publics. Um, and I drew the line across 58 to show you. So that's the average at Plymouth State across the next two. So your female male ratio, like every other university, college, community college in the country, um, uh, female students, those coded female, are graduating at higher rates than men or completing at higher rates than male students. And um, the next bar, I pulled this from the website. Um, so students who are coded as white, 59% um, are graduating. Students who are other racial and ethnic minority groups are graduating at 50%. That is still well above the national average, so that you know that. Um, that's actually great. Um, it's, it, it's hard to look at that gap and, and be proud of that, but trust me, that is a smaller gap than a whole lot of places, including my own institution, have. Um, and then the final column, uh, these data I had to put together from the IPEDS website. So these are the fall 2012 entering students. Um, the red bar is at Plymouth State's uh, graduation rate for that year. So important to notice that in the two years difference between those cohorts, your graduation rate actually went up from about 54% to 58%. That is remarkable. Getting a four point increase in just two years is almost unheard of. Um, Georgia State University in Atlanta is, is doing this kind of thing and getting way more press for it than Plymouth State is. So I will be making a point of always talking about Plymouth State's success in this area. Um, it's really exciting to see that actually in just two years to go up to point, it's, it's really hard to do that. Um, but to get that lift. But that's the non-Pell student and the Pell student. So your students who are receiving Pell grants are graduating at about 49% uh, and those uh, without Pell grants a little higher. So that's where we see the economic difference kind of spreading out. But in general, your gaps are quite small. And this is something to be really proud of. Um, yes, you want to keep increasing everything, of course, but these are not, these, these are good. Like lots of schools will look at this and be like, whew, that's our goal. And honestly, Michigan State has got some uh, racial and ethnic gaps that are we have closed from 30 points between black students and the rest of the students to about 20 um, in about 10 years. So it's taken us a while, right? And we are really radically still different on that. So um, we're not proud of the gap, we're proud of closing it, but this is aspirational for us. So I'll, again, I'll be showing this slide everywhere I go. So congrats on all that good work. It means there's good things happening here. Um, and it means there's still some work to be done on that equity stance. And then, of course, you want to continue to boost, right? The fact that 58 out of 100 students start, you know, the sort of the, the canard in higher ed is, you know, what other industry would tolerate a 40% failure rate? 40% of the planes fall out of the sky. 40% of your root canals have to be redone. You know, whatever you want to pick for that thing, you don't want 40% um, to be uh, your failure rate. So we all want to get that higher, of course. Um, there was a time before I went to college um, that, you know, a public university was a few hundred or several, maybe a few thousand dollars a year for tuition at, at a time. So you could be open access, let everybody come in. It wasn't really going to harm them if they didn't get through. Um, they weren't going to end up with tens of thousands of student debt. Um, but now that's not true any longer, right? So the students we bring in, um, what we say at Michigan State is every student we admit has the capacity to learn, thrive, and graduate. And it's our job to change the institution to make that possible, right? So thinking about how can you get from your 58 to your 100? I do know also, I noted that a lot of your students transfer out to other places where they do complete. And that is not recognized nationally as an important statistic. I actually think that that's really important to be able to say, yeah, 58% graduated from Plymouth State and another 15% or 20% graduated from other places. We did our part. 
and that's actually a pretty important message to, uh, to, to convey back to your state and your system office. Like, we are doing our part. They're not counting for our big 58% there, but we did a great job with getting them to their next place. So I think that's really worth talking about as well. So that's where you are at Plymouth State, um, and it was really kind of fun to, to see these great stats. All right, I'm gonna talk a bit about um, higher ed. So we've seen sort of how things aren't working. Um, w edwards demings the internet says maybe he said it maybe he didn't um, so attributed to um, every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets so plymouth state is perfectly designed to have 42 out of 100 students leave before they get a degree it is perfectly designed to maintain the gaps it's perfectly designed for the things it's getting so when we think about if the system is designed to get the results it gets and we want to change the results I've developed sort of a theory around two different major barriers that I'll talk about. And the first is silos. So I think without even knowing, I would mention the word silos, it came up <clears throat> in uh, the president's remarks, the provost's remarks, in the panel. Um, so I think that I, I was teasing with Robin, um, some of us have a slightly uh, cynical conference habit where you make a bingo card of like trendy overused terms that you'll be hearing at a conference, impactful, you know, um, hit me with some, you know, education, technology, whatever. Um, I think silos would be the center square today. So if you've got that on your bingo card for today, uh, you're going to win. So silos, I want to talk about sort of how they exist in higher ed. First, I'm going to talk about students and how they exist in their ecosystem. So you see the blue circle? We're going to call that a student. You can make that any student you want. You can imagine yourself, a young person you know, an adult returning learner, students. Students are surrounded by what we call the microsystems, and these are the individual places they are in their lives. It's pretty intuitive. It's their, where they live. It's their classes. It's an academic uh, laboratory. It might be a performing arts group. It's their campus job or their job off campus or their multiple jobs off campus, right? So these are the individual places where they live and learn. These places work together to create what's called a mesosystem. So the messages I'm getting about being a student at Plymouth State, what it means to be a panther, what it means to be successful here. You know, ideally, all my microsystems are kind of working together to support that. Um, there could be tension among the microsystems. That's not a bad thing, but it does mean that we need to think about which students are getting different kinds of messages and different polls from their different systems and how they might need different support. So that's the mesosystem. We have an exosystem, and what I like about the exosystem is that Traditionally in higher ed, we think about um, the settings the students in. How do I improve my teaching? How do I be a better coach? Um, if I am directing a student play, how do I also make sure they're succeeding in their other classes while they're rehearsing 27 hours a day, what have you? But the exosystem accounts for the places the student isn't, but that affect their development and their learning. So this is the faculty committee that's making a decision about are we going to require minors on top of the cluster major things? Sorry something cluster major things. Um, this is the committee that's deciding financial aid. This is um, state policy. So when we think about this exosystem, there's lots of policies, programs, decisions in student, that affect students' lives that students aren't in them at all, so, but they still affect them. And those are places that some of you actually live, work, do your work, and thinking about your impact back through the inner systems to the student. And some of them are places we need to have influence. Um, so among federal uh, people deciding things about federal aid and whatnot. So the exosystem, I think, is real important. And then the macro system that we all live in, um, it's cultural expectations, it's major events like a global pandemic. And these are all the things that kind of influence the whole system. Um, and these are the kinds of developments over time that have meant that many of us in this room who never would have gone to college um, when uh, the colonies were here and they were sort of sent their little settler colonial colleges um, to educate white men, and if you Native Americans, long story, um, it didn't work out well for them. Um, thinking about um, these macro system effects that have made it possible for people who identify as women, for people of color, for immigrants to enter the higher ed system in the United States. So those are all kinds of things around the ecosystem of the student. And what I like about an ecosystem model is that it's different for every single student. So instead of having like the one size fits all, so the problem with the college completion agenda, which has been like, you know, uh, much spoken about by foundations and uh, federal government for a long time, the college completion agenda, this thing we were supposed to have 60% of United States citizens with a college degree by the year 2025. Not happening. It's because the people who were behind that thought we could come up with one solution that would fit everybody. And so the Gates Foundation and the Lumina Foundation funded a bunch of ed tech companies to create things like your friend EAB. I understand you're an EAB campus and some of you are scowling now and some of you are like, I don't know what that is, but 
real. Um, so the ed tech companies got funded to create these solutions that were going to fix higher ed and fix students because there would be one solution. The problem is there's not one solution for every student. It involves curriculum and student life and staff and their campus job and the folks in the cafeteria and the people like Rachel they meet who are painting their rooms who help them understand how they all fit together, right? So that's what it takes to help a student be successful. So this is a model I work with a lot. It's a model I'm really attached to, you can tell. Um, I think it's a helpful way to think about students. However, higher ed kind of organizes itself like this. We've got families on the outside, we've got federal policy on the outside, social and cultural forces, off-campus jobs on the outside. Within the institution, we get like administration and student affairs maybe on one side, we get faculty and academic affairs, and we operate like this, even though students are living immersed like that, right? So students are in this kind of holistic environment, but we're making them live in this siloed environment. And the point that Vasti Torres and I have made in that Change Magazine article that um, the provost just mentioned is that there's actually movement to more silos. The student success agenda has really, and the focus on metrics has pressed us into more silos. We separated student affairs from student success services in some places, and we separated our academic affairs from faculty. Because like I just said, a lot of us who do academic administration still think we're faculty. Other faculty don't think we're still faculty. Um, we are the administration, capital T, capital A. Um, so we really are moving to more silos in higher education. And this is at small institutions as well as large. And the kind of work you're doing here in the clusters and the kind of focus of this week might be able to help us kind of synthesize that. So silos are one of the major structural problems. I'm gonna talk a bit about um, what that specifically looks like at Plymouth State. So here's Plymouth State University. You have federal and state policy and uh, external resources and constraints are in the big green circle. So those are things not here. You don't get to control those necessarily. Perhaps you influence some, but they influence what happens at Plymouth State. You have a campus culture, campus policy, and then internal constraints that affect what you're able to do, right? So those are kind of internal. You have some say in them. You are shaped by your culture. Your culture shapes you. You're shaped by your policy. Your policy shapes you. Um, so that's all kind of going on sort of here at Plymouth State. And then I put in the big cloudy murk there, historical cultural expectations and history and social forces. So that's kind of Plymouth State in general. And here you'll have people, how many people here work in student affairs? I know a bunch of them are out like help work, working with students today. Anybody in here does student affairs, identifies in student affairs work or does student affairs, student services? Hmm, not many, okay. They are literally out doing that. They are greeting people and moving them into dorms and those kinds of things, which I'm supposed to call residence halls. Um, so student affairs folks, and I work closely in this field, I train student affairs educators who are going to go out and kind of change the world and change higher ed. We have a set of theories we use, we have values around diversity and inclusion, holistic um, education. We believe that development happens by balancing challenge and support. Um, and we do things like create environments to promote student development and student learning. That's kind of how we think of our jobs historically. Some people on campus think of student affairs people as like the parties people or the discipline people. Um, it is true that there are people in student affairs who plan events and who handle student conduct, uh, but there's a whole lot more behind that. So that's one of the silos. So another silo, academic affairs. Um, these are folks who kind of work in retention services often. Um, they are responsible, they believe that students who do a certain set of things like high impact practices, undergraduate research, study abroad, um, uh, service learning, uh, this is a set of folks engaged in promoting those kinds of activities for students that uh, we believe students will respond to these things and we believe we can kind of help faculty get better at those things. So engaging students in their learning is often an academic affairs perspective. And there's some blur here, like academic advisors in some places think of themselves as student affairs, and in some places they think of themselves as academic affairs. But in any case, these are sort of different ways of thinking and being. Faculty, how many people here just like straight up instructing faculty? Excellent, yay. Um, so if, if we are guided by theories outside our own disciplines, that they are things around teaching and learning, beliefs in how people learn things and how we work as teachers. Um, Often values prioritize academic freedom, autonomy, um, ideas around individual achievement and merit, um, which things like the clusters are designed to help us work and think across, right? And then the beliefs, some faculty are like, look, we're gonna blame the student, like, or the admissions office. They were not Plymouth State material. I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do for you. Um, or others are very deeply engaged in success work. And I'm guessing that those who are ready to blame the students are probably not here today um, in person or on Zoom. Um, I'd like to hope that they are 
rethinking their educational philosophy, um, hopefully. Uh, and then we do, we do teaching and academic activities, right? Like I've got two courses starting soon, one of which syllabus is a new prep for me and is only in my head today. Um, sort of hoping for a delayed air flight back so I can get some work done on that. But, um, you know, thinking about how we are going to uh, account for pandemics and um, racial equity and all kinds of other things in our teaching and learning as the world grows around us. So that's faculty. We've got a lot going on there. And then the student success services I talked about, like these are folks who are engaged in tutoring and um, be trio programs, ascent, like this is kind of a very, it's, it's a growing, um, industry is a big word for it, but it's a growing concentration. You can now have a whole career where you start as a student success coach at an institution and work your way up to be the vice president of student success at some places. Um, so it's become a new kind of uh, silo that has um, not necessarily academic affairs, not necessarily student affairs, but a whole sort of separate way and space of supporting student success um, with a particular institutional goals around student persistence, student graduation. So these are all good things, um, but it is a little different from the other areas. And there is blur across these, but what we end up with is this silo within Plymouth State University of people who don't necessarily talk to each other. And then the student, we make them kind of run between the silos. You gotta figure out how to get your tutoring and your disability student services and pay your bill and uh, learn no longer Moodle, but Canvas, um, right? And I loved what Matt said before about, yeah, it could be that like your students are using four different platforms for their different online classes and things, right? So we're gonna make the student run around across all those things. It is not necessarily a system set up for student success overall. This does not help many people. And those of you who are new to Plymouth State, welcome, very exciting. I admire you, uh, whether you started last year or this, beginning a new job in a pandemic in a new place, bless your hearts. Like, thank you for like trusting, right? Like that you were coming to the right place. Cause I, I think you probably have come to the right place. Um, you may have already found some silos. Uh, a friend of mine did uh, some work at uh, another university, uh, not yours, not mine, um, on summer orientation for new faculty and found out that they were caught in an endless loop of you couldn't get your parking till you got your ID, but you couldn't get your ID till you had a certain kind of letter from HR and you couldn't get that without this and this and somehow it came back to parking. So you couldn't actually onboard unless you found Betty, who was the, the one person who was like, oh, don't worry about it, I'll take care of that for you, hon. I was like, well, if you don't know Betty, how are you going to get around this circle, right? Um, another institution I know uh, has had a sort of similar thing around student financial aid, and they literally would, there was one person in the financial aid office who had been there for 40 years who could just help you out. And everybody's like, well, I got a guy. I got a guy over in financial aid. It's, okay, it was in Rhode Island, right, where everybody's got a guy for something. Like, oh, I got a guy, the guy in financial aid. Yeah, I got a guy over in tutoring. Yeah, I got a guy. You can't be successful if it all relies on I got a guy. And you got to find the person who's got the guy, right? So we need to be more coordinated. We need to be, do more overlap, more collaboration, more communication, more empathy. I love that empathy and listening came up this morning, right? More empathy for understanding, because that also helps us build our network. So we do got a guy. So we can be listening to a student or a colleague who has a problem and help them kind of navigate and make that connection as well. So I think that's a really big part of it, what we need to do. And that really brings us to the essential elements of student success, right? They need their basic needs met. If they are hungry, if they don't know where they're gonna live, if they have no health care, those all need to be accounted for. We need to make sure they've got a sense of self. And that's gonna grow and evolve, but, they, but helping them develop one. Um, they need to belong to community. That came up a lot in the panel this morning. Sounds like the Panther community is strong. They do need internal motivation. This isn't gonna happen without their own doing it. You don't get through college without sort of doing the work yourself. They need to be engaged. Um, a growth mindset can help. That idea that you know maybe uh, if I make a mistake, I can keep learning. Um, it's not just that I'm bad at stats. Um, I could learn to do them, kind of growth mindset work. We need to create navigable pathways, especially when we start doing collaborative work and start using fancy words like clusters. Um, I think for students, like maybe their experience was like an older brother, a cousin, a parent, somebody they know was like, you know, well, they were an econ major at UNH how do I find the econ major and just do that thing here, right? Like that's a navigable pathway. I can see what the courses are. So making sure as we get innovative and collaborative and kind of work across boundaries, we help translate that to, the, to people who aren't gonna share that vocabulary or know how to make through the pathways. And then we need really great curriculum and pedagogy to help students be successful. Like that's what you're, I think, committed to, part of why you're here today. So those are some of the things that I think about when I think about the siloed condition, the ecosystems students live in, 
the mismatch between those, and where we might want to get to as we're moving forward, and part of the collaborating across faculty, staff, different kinds of categories of work. So I want to talk now about a second systemic bridge barrier. So silos are the first barrier of why designed to get the results it gets. The other is low bridges. Now, here's the deal. There's some controversy about this. Robert Moses was the urban designer who laid out like all of greater New York. Okay, he was apparently a virulent racist. It is documented, it's clear. The next part is what's controversial, and that's not controversial, that's terrible. The next part's controversial. One of his biographies claimed that he purposely designed the parkway bridges in New York to be too low for public buses so that the African-American community in the city couldn't get to Jones Beach. So you could keep Jones Beach segregated if the buses people were using couldn't go under the bridges. So that's what one of these major biographies of Robert Moses says. And I'm not defending the guy at all, but there is apparently some controversy about whether or not that part was actually true. Even the people who say that part wasn't true are like, oh no, truly, he was a horrible racist. So I'm a little less concerned right now about whether or not the Low Bridges story itself is true. But I grew up driving in Connecticut, Southern Connecticut is where I grew up. And I remember learning to drive on these parkways and the dreaded, your parents think you have to learn to drive to New York to be competent somehow as a, as a 16 year old driver. And um, I remember being a little scared. I was like to drive under these low bridges. Um, so it's a story that sticks with me. Um, and whether or not those were designed to keep like white suburban kids out of New York or people off Jones Beach, the idea is that we inherit in our lives, in our institutions and in our organizations, in our families, structures we didn't design, but they create barriers for some people and we have to live with them because New York has not gone back and like redone all those bridges. And I'm pretty sure the new infrastructure bill isn't gonna make new bridges for all those places. This is like hundreds of bridges, right? So thinking about whether or not that's true, and again, you, you could just fall down a rabbit hole online. I, I did and came back um, about Robert Moses, racist. Um, this idea that we have systems in place. And when I think about those systems at Michigan State, we had this, um, just listen to how bad this sounds. So when I got to Michigan State in 2001, there was a course called Math 1825. Math 1825 was remedial. It was even in 2001 taught only online. And it was quote unquote taught by the people who wrote the textbook who were making the money from it. A third of our 8,000 entering students tested into Math 1825. So that's several thousand students taking this course where the instructors are getting the textbook and they're running this terrible online class for remedial math, pre-college algebra. Um, you paid tuition for it, of course. Um, whatever grade you got would hit your GPA, but you got no credit towards graduation for it because it was pre-college level. So all it could do was take money from you and screw up your GPA because the drop, fail, and withdrawal rate was about 45%. So people had to take math at 18 drive over and over and over online, because that gets better over time, right? So, um, you know, hideous, terrible. And we knew about this for a long time. And of course, we also knew that it disproportionately affected our Black students and our Latinx students, because those are the students whose high schools prepared them less well for college math. So we had a specific course in our curriculum that we were making a lot of money from the institution on. And frankly, the textbook designers were making a lot of money too. And yes, they were in the math department. <sighs> okay, I worked that up. So one year we decided we're getting rid of math 1825. And here's how we're going to do it. So we developed a co-requisite course. We piloted it, we tested it, we got some great folks involved in it through these kinds of collaborations. Um, it was some chemistry and math and physics faculty uh, who were doing innovative pedagogy. Uh, we're like, let's maybe not try to teach online asynchronous math to students who have trouble with college algebra concepts. Maybe we should do that in person sometimes. So we redeveloped it and we really, and we changed it. So now the, the first college math class you take spreads across two semesters. Um, we've got the co-requisites in it. It's based on competency-based grading um, and students are thriving in it. And our DFW drop fail withdraw rate is down to very low. We're down to about 10 to 15%, which is not wildly uncommon for some of our you know, 100 level courses overall. And you get credit for it. You can also retake it to fix your grade if you want to, but uh, it's, not, it's, it's not just taking their money and hurting their GPAs anymore. Low bridge. Get rid of the class. It was clearly a low bridge to equity and to success at Michigan State. We had students take it five, six, seven times before they would finally ask for like a, a waiver of it kind of thing. So that was a low bridge. We have a lot of other low bridges. Those of you who work in disability access services know the physical low bridges, of course. 
all over the place on campus. Um, some of our online technologies, some of the things we did on Zoom last year or Moodle or whatever, Teams, however you were teaching, some of them created barriers for some students um, more than others, right? So thinking about the low bridges we inherit. Um, and again, if you get interested in Robert Moses, go read it, it's terribly interesting. Um, so thinking about what are the low bridges? So as we want to break down these silos and we want to fix the low bridges or create overpasses over them or whatever, how are we going to deal with the structural inequities we've inherited? This involves staff and it involves faculty, academic affairs and student affairs. Most of these problems weren't created by just one department, or maybe they were, <clears throat> hello math at Michigan State, um, maybe they were created by one department, but to solve them, they are these wicked and messy little problems, right? You're going to need more people to get in there and figure it out. Um, they're not how we do this we need to think about a culture of evidence right so we need to look at our data um, and places to do this are to look at academic data what are the high dfw courses what are the different dfw rates in those courses in terms of different student populations you're interested in? can you pick one of them and give kind of a go at thinking about how might you remove that as a barrier for certain kinds of students right how do you help students learn without just getting in their way right so using a culture of evidence, where are our gaps? And one of the things you'll have the opportunity to do this afternoon um, in a very fun, engaging, not as long as posted in the schedule activity that uh, Dr. DeRosa told you about uh, is a way to start thinking about how you might do that. But engaging your data folks in this is really important. Um, fixing low bridges is not just about programs. We'd love to throw a program at something in higher ed. And my folks in student affairs were like the worst about this. We'll just keep adding programs. Well, there's diversity training and there's title line training and here's these things. We're just going to add and add and add. We won't take anything away. Um, and partly, and this came up when Matt's talk this morning, um, partly we don't take programs away because, well, that's somebody's job. You know, their person runs that program. We can't take that away. Um, but it's not just about programs. We're not trying to fix the students. We're trying to fix the bridges and the silos. So keeping our focus on the bridges and the silos and not on the students can be helpful. Um, thinking about how we acknowledge our interconnectedness and the empathy and listening, um, building synergy, kind of creating collective energy, and especially as we all move out of the pandemic, through the pandemic, I'm not sure what we're doing now, um, but as we move into the next place of this, acknowledging the energy it takes and the ways that are different and continuing to remember that empathy we sort of gathered for ourselves and each other back in the pivot semester, right? Like remember when people were like, oh, give grace and these things. Like that happens in the reverse direction as well. And it happens when we are trying to uh, come through as a community in resolving hard problems under difficult situations. Um, organizational alignment has got to be there to really address these silos. And this is the hard part where it could mean moving some people or um, which can feel a lot like, uh, it can feel a lot like you're being moved because you did something wrong. Um, I think the, the provost comment about like we when people make changes, it's because I'm my I don't belong. My identity's not right here. Um, having open, transparent conversations to think about how we're going to do that, and it's not about you know Chris, your unit's doing something bad or wrong or inadequately, but we need to move you into this other unit because that's where the synergy and the goal that's where it has to be. That's really hard stuff. Um, but it does sort of need to happen, the organizational alignment. And it's an organizational alignment's not, in my mind, code for just cutting your budget. It might be for other people, so I can't say it's never used that way. But I do really think about like, think about the silos and the separation. And, and if, if this were moved closer to this, how would that benefit students and, and colleagues? And then thinking about how we center student success over our sub-organizational identities and territory. And that's really hard. Um, having a common vocabulary about what you're trying to do with and for students and with and for each other's colleagues. Um, this is hard work and it's threatening and it's kind of scary. Um, and we are in the process of it at Michigan State. Every university I know is in the process of this in some way and it is hard and scary everywhere. It helps, I think it's helped me to begin to articulate and develop um, a philosophy of student success. All students can succeed. Every student we admit can learn, thrive and graduate. Right. Um, equity. If we keep equity as a goal, we're going to close these opportunity gaps. Some people call those things achievement gaps, the graduation differences. There's been a strong movement among uh, folks thinking about equity to say, you know, achievement gap pins it right on the student and opportunity gap pins it a little back more on the organization. We have created gaps and opportunity for some sets of students. So think about how do we close those opportunity gaps. And again, yours are like really great, which doesn't mean you shouldn't get better. Um, but they're not terrible at all. Um, so how we think about increasing success is a moral imperative. Um, I work with a number of colleagues at Michigan State and other institutions who can articulate a very strong case for the moral imperative 
of do this. My former provost at Michigan State would talk about, um, you know, she thought about when a student came to Michigan State and left without a degree for financial, academic, personal reasons. She said, you know, they leave here with a hole in their heart and believing that they're stupid, right? And the moral imperative to not leave human beings with a hole in their heart and believing that they're stupid. That's meaningful, right? Like that, there, there's a moral imperative there to get this right and do the hard work to get it right. Evidence comes from lots of sources. Lots, some of it is more compelling than others. Um, you know, the anec data, the anecdote. Um, we always, we had that one student who. So one of the things we did at Michigan State was to um, uh, stop. We had a number of students who would be on like academic probation and then like extended probation and then like double secret extended academic probation. You could be like six semesters into having below a 2.0, literally. And of course, what we learned is that if you are six semesters into having less than a 2.0, your chance of graduating is like tiny. It was less than 5%, your chance of ever graduating because we'd let you stay at Michigan State on academic probation for that many more semesters, paying tuition, never getting a 2.0, which you have to have in order to join a major and graduate. So it was really hard to work with our academic advising staff and others to say, we're not gonna keep doing that. Any case that's gonna be extended after one semester has to come to a little review committee that's made up of academic advisors from different departments. But that was the place where, you know, it was really easy for me as an academic advisor to be like, yeah, but you know, Susie did it. She was on academic probation for six semesters and then she got her act together and she did it. 20 years ago, Susie graduated. Um, you know, because like, we all have a Susie, right? And, and a lot of us who are in this work have big hearts and are full of optimism and hope. We believe in Susie. I'm like, yes. And for every Susie, there were 95 not Susies who we took their money, they never finished, student debt, holding their heart, thinking they're stupid, right? So compelling evidence, Susie, but thinking about how do we look at our data and share our data in ways that help. And so when we show people the charts, it was a little harder to be like, ooh, yeah, Susie really was quite exceptional. Um, how, do we, how do we help students not end up in academic probation? So this doesn't, so let's, let's start at the beginning of those six semesters and work our way from there, right? So we've been doing that, but it took us a long time to help people understand that this wasn't, um, it's like I'm not believe, it's not that I don't believe you and the story of Susie and God love her, Susie, but most people in that situation don't turn, that isn't their story. So let the equity piece, and of course this was hitting students from different social groups differently than others. So how do we use the other kinds of data we have? And I happen to be a qualitative researcher. So for me to argue for like using the stats over the stories is uh, counter my usual way. Um, I believe in the value of the single story, but I also believe that those 95 not Susies had their own stories and they were not good stories for those students. I just didn't get to hear them because they left. We got rid of them before I could hear their story, right? So thinking about our evidence and keeping our heart in the work and bringing our head into the work as well, I think is really important. Um, organizational individual capacity building, these are ongoing processes. Like how do we learn to do that? How do we learn who, who is the person I could ask for, um, you know, the students in my major, like uh, what are their GPAs and how do they, how does that compare? Whatever the data are, like, you know, what's the graduation rate broken down by race and sex for the students in my major? Uh, students who start in my major and the students who finish. Um, uh, it's quite common on many campuses that nursing education starts modestly diverse in terms of race and ethnicity, not usually in terms of sex, but modestly diverse. But by the time you finish, you've got a whole lot of white female students, right? So let me look at those data. Just give me those data. But you got to know who to ask. Where do I go on my campus to get those data? Who could I ask those questions of? Um, how can I find out um, how the students in my class do in other classes? Like if I give a student a, um, uh, a B, is, how does that, you know, how do they do later? If a student in my class gets a C, are they successful later? What do I need to do to help them learn the things to get to the next point? But you gotta know where to ask for the data. So that's a capacity building question. And then organizationally, you gotta have some of the, the background to help that, right? Um, but also days like this, time to think about developing a common language, common philosophies. I think these are really important capacity building activities. Um, Higher ed is supposed to be about education, adult learning, we can all learn and get better, but it takes a long time and is really hard to do under duress. Um, it is really hard to do in a pandemic. It is hard to do in a hurricane in a pandemic. It is hard to do under, um, with a drastic looking little demographic cliff there that the promo showed us. Um, and it's particularly true that the Northern, the, the sort of the Northern part of the country, like we're all just, ugh, it's bad. Um, 
So we're going to poach each other's students, right? Like we're coming for New Hampshire students like nobody's business. I actually saw a New Hampshire license plate in East Lansing the other day. I was like, oh, good on MSU. Um, sorry. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, we're all, yeah, the whole Midwest, like all those Rust Belt schools are coming for you, uh, are coming for your students. Um, so we want to take that out-of-state tuition. We'll give them a few thousand dollars scholarship and they can feel special. Then we'll take their out-of-state tuition. Why not, right? Um, so that's, it's, it's, it's going to be, you know, it's terrible. Um, so, uh, and I know you're, you're also doing the same thing. You are after Connecticut students who want to live in the mountains. I know this. URI students who are tired of the beach, whatever. Um, you want them. So thinking about um, how we learn these things under duress, when we are under threat, when we are under layoffs and furloughs and consolidations, this is not a great time to be open to learning. And to learn because we think we need to learn just to survive is not a great motivation for learning. But we do, I think in higher ed, in public higher ed especially, we do need to get better at learning. And not, and, and, and please, this isn't, uh, I am so, this is not like, you know, the manager of the local Piggly Wiggly is gonna come in and manage us better because higher ed doesn't know how to manage itself and all we do is like, that's not my line at all. It's that we need to learn to be more compassionate, more empathetic, uh, cl more collaborative because the system that got us here um, silos and territory and interdepartmental competition isn't the system that's going to get us where we need to be. So in addition to being better for students, it also is going to be a better survival strategy, frankly. Um, so we can work together, I think, across the silos, centering student success, and this will help us with this organizational capacity building and curricular and pedagogical, um, and it's going to be hard. So that sounds like fun. So how do we do it? So one of the things we do is we have days like today, weeks like this week, you come together, you meet new people, you reconnect with old friends who um, you haven't seen except in a box for a while, little square boxes, you admire each other's footwear, which is a few years out of date. Um, and uh, you, you do this to say that, but also to celebrate, like I'm, I'm, I keep saying it, but I really am impressed with your, like your gap data is great. Um, we're gonna talk about process mapping in a minute as a way to kind of get through the strategy. And then we'll talk about kind of what are the barriers and facilitators um, for the low bridges and the overpasses. So, all right, we're gonna talk about process mapping. This is a very specific strategy. It actually comes from business. Uh, that's where I learned it from, but uh, okay. Um, and uh, there's numerous applications for student success and it's really great for identifying low bridges. Like that thing at UMass where you had to get your ID to get your license and that sort of thing. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about how it used for low bridges. And um, the University Innovation Alliance is a group of 11 large public universities. Uh, and uh, Georgia State happens to be one. Michigan State is one. There's several others now. And this is where I learned it. I happen to get to be working directly with them through my role as an academic administrator. So some of you on campus uh, cringe at the name EAB, which is a large ed tech company, um, they have done a couple great things. One of them is this graphic I'm showing you now. So this graphic, um, and I'm that person who's like, don't worry about what's exactly in there, um, which I hate. I don't let my students do that on their slides. Like, don't do a slide. I'm gonna say, I know you can't read it, but that's not nice. What you see on the top is uh, a group of community college administrators got together to say, all right, so the time a student applies, that's the box on the far left, to the time they enroll in classes, that's the box on the far right. What do they do? Oh, they apply, they get their financial aid, they uh, go to academic advising, they sign up for the courses. Yeah, that's how that works, right? Sure. That's how that works. If you're a student, I call it the spaghetti pile. You do your application and then you end up in this set of loops. You get financial aid verification. Could you please go get us a bunch more documents from your parents if you're a dependent student or on your own? Financial aid documentation. You can't see an academic advisor in that department until you are registered for courses in that department round and round in loops. So it's amazing that a student actually gets the first day of classes. So when you take what administrators, the quote unquote grownups thought was happening, and then you actually looked at how the system works, it's kind of a mess. Um, some process mapping processes would put timelines on those things as well. Um, you can or you choose not to do that. But thinking about what are the low bridges in that spaghetti pile, the dozens of ways a student could get bumped off that. EAB also has a version that um, shoots and ladders, like that kids game, shoots and ladders, that board game where you like climb and climb, but then if you land on the spot that's a, a, a slide, the shoot, you slide back to the beginning, right? There's all kinds of shoots and ladders for our students where un unknowingly you could just sort of land in a place that sets you back six steps. Um, financial holds are great for this. We're going to drop you from your classes for financial reasons. Now you're going to go back into all your classes. Oh, wait, there's a wait list for half your classes, blah, 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 right? So thinking about process mapping. At Michigan State, we sort of learned about this through the University Innovation Alliance. 
And one of the problems we identified is students don't read their email anymore, um, or they're not responding to their emails. We never really knew. Um, so we took that as a the process of interest we wanted to map was communications from Michigan State to students. From the time they say, yes, I'm coming, they pay their first deposit thing, whatever, to the end of their first term. We thought that cannot be that hard, right? So we wanted to look especially at how this was going to be affecting low income, first gen, Latinx, black students, maybe students whose parents didn't uh, also speak English. So these would be international students or uh, US students with parents not speaking English. So we're like, this, how, how bad could this be? So we're like, all right, who do we think are the people who send messages to students? So we got a whole gang together, admissions and recruitment and IT and financial aid. And so we got everybody together in one big room, um, back when you could do that, um, without masks and eat sandwiches and stuff in person. It was so old fashioned sounding. So we brought 65 people together for a couple days, which was kind of an investment of time. As, as, as some people say, what an expensive meeting that was. Um, all those vice presidents, okay. Um, and that's what we did. So we divided up into tables by functional areas and we gave people different colored sticky notes. I did not know there were that many colored sticky notes, but our brilliant staff found them around town. And that is just the first year. Um, the swim, the horizontal swim lanes represent an office, so the colored sticky notes per office, and then the vertical columns are months. So this is months for the first year. And people just wrote up all the standard emails they sent out during that time. Like this isn't like, except like, I don't know, uh, Chris, you didn't do your thing, here's an email just for you. This was like, sign up for three on three volleyball, right? This was generic emails, also exacerbated when, for environmental reasons, Everybody made their hand, you, things that used to be hands out at orientations became PDS, which will just attach to an email and we'll just send to the incoming students. That'll work. So these were all emails coming to students from an at msu.edu address. There were over 440 emails that we knew of from that group. Each sticky note is one. Directing students to dozens of different portals that weren't coordinated, didn't connect, probably you had to sign in and have a different password for all of them. And through these different processes, if you missed certain kinds of emails, there were hundreds of ways you could end up on a different kind of hold, financial hold, academic hold, registration hold, whatever. And we wouldn't have known that, except that that came up, that wasn't our job mapping the holds, but we were like sitting together, we're like, oh, you can get a hold for that. We had holds nobody knew how to get rid of. We're like, like the financial people were like, I don't know, it's a financial hold, but I don't know who you would talk to to get rid of that hold. So a student could be stuck forever in the financial hold and never register. So we created a small team. They prioritized and reduced. They thought about alternatives to email. Then there was a pandemic, so that all went away. Um, and we built a community of professionals focused on student success. Like this is a group that had literally never been in the same room together. Like, so we did all come out of it with like, I got a guy, but also like we were thinking about this more seriously. And so this looks really messy. This is the result of that work, but there's only about like 45 or 50 or so different emails on that chart over the first year, which is consolidated and we prioritized. But you couldn't do that when each person was working in their own silo, because how would I know that my message about sign up for rec sports might not be as important at that moment as you've got to pay your bill or you're disenrolled. Just because people hadn't thought about it before, right? So this is sort of where we got to. And across the University Innovation Alliance, and you could uh, look it up at the UIA.org if you're interested, um, we've done does it, and there's a, a, a toolkit online for process mapping there. Um, people pick different processes, different spaghetti piles, medical withdrawals and readmissions, academic probation dismissal, how to get rid of an enrollment hold, communication, transfer, majors, new student orientation, veterans benefits, how to come back if you've been away for a long time, but you want to come back and finish your degree. Those are just some of the processes that the UIA different campuses have tried. And you sort of see in the picture, um, you know, these are very messy. Mapping processes can be very messy. Whiteboards aren't even enough. You need to be able to move stuff around. So that's just an example of sort of the, how, to, how to deal with a spaghetti pile, um, to, to begin to figure out how to get the low bridges. Like where are the low bridges in that spaghetti pile that are gonna keep a student veteran from getting their benefits accurately around time? Or they're gonna keep that student who's like, I'm, just, I'm not gonna, I'm almost, you know, I, I finished my junior year at Plymouth State and I, you know, I don't know if there's a way to get back and finish it. I, I, you know, they try one person and they get a dead end and so they don't try anymore, right? Like, how do we create, how do we get rid of the low bridges so people can kind of get done? So I've talked about uh, two uh, design features, silos and low bridges that create problems for students. Talked about one strategy, which one strategy for beginning to identify some of those, uh, work across silos to identify the low bridges. Um, why don't we do this more often? So um, organizational cultures don't always promote this. Um, competition, turfness, um, busyness, just it's just too busy. Um, habit and inertia, I've never done it before. I don't know who to find. 
um, I'm trying to be a first year instructor in a pandemic. I have other priorities right now. Also, my kid is home from school, right? So there's a lot of inertia habits. Um, and there's also um, turf and stubbornness and hurt feelings. For all those times we purposely or accidentally or unintentionally and probably unknowingly left a group out who still feels that pretty painfully. So there, those are barriers to collaboration and being able to say, well, I, I will reach out. I, 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 they hurt our feelings 15 years ago, but I, I guess maybe it's time to think about reaching out again. Um, and then facilitators, understanding keep student success, for example, as like a, a common mindset, thinking about the mutual benefit, which you heard a lot about in the collaboration before. Um, and then you've got structures here. Most places don't have like a, like a template in their heads for how to do this, but you had begun this before pandemic time, right? And can get back into doing this work. I think it's a potential real solution. And I think it also addresses some major higher ed wide large solutions. This idea of you know, focusing academic work around particular kinds of problems, right? Um, so you've got a, a huge leg up on most other places already in starting this who, you know, in Michigan State, I, we, oh yeah. Clusters, oh yeah, no. Um, I, I was trying to describe this to some friends the other day and they're like, together? I was like, they do, they talk together. Um, yeah, it's not just their own, they're, they're friends in their department, right? They might even talk with friends in other departments or other people in the department who aren't their close friends. Um, so I, I think that you've got a, a real head start on this from other people, but you do need to, to I think, lean into that and really build on that energy. Um, champions and stakeholders, find the people who are doing it and find the stakeholders, really important. Start with easy wins, quote, I, you know, amplify the choir. I'm guessing all of you here today have a certain kind of commitment to the institution, to student success. Um, this is great. You, we should amplify your voices, right? Absolutely, celebrate and amplify. Focusing on small bites, like don't try to change everything at once. Um, assess, adapt, and scale things that are working. Um, I love the idea of recognizing partners and helping them describe their work to peers. So when I started talking with other faculty members about student success, people were like, yeah, how am I going to describe that like on my CV? Or how do I tell my department chair about that when it's time for my annual review? Um, how do I describe that in my uh, academic discipline when I go to conferences with other evolutionary biologists? How do I describe this work I'm doing on creating this cool new not remedial math, right? So helping people get that language. And the way to do that is to talk with each other about kind of what works, how you want to describe it. But it really has helped us. And it's also helped us on the staff side to say, how do you help a staff person explain to their supervisor that this work they're doing with the evolutionary biology faculty is really important and worth having their time to do, right? So it really involves helping people tell their own story. Um, we got to ignore, acknowledge our barriers. Like, yeah, I did do that terrible thing to you 15 years ago, or my department did, and we're really sorry. You know, when we elbowed you out of the way to get that grant, um, or to take that money that Provost was offering as a grant, whatever it was, like, I wish I had done that differently. Like, I wish I hadn't thrown the elbows quite as hard. Um, and then looking for existing successes that haven't been acknowledged. So as you're looking through the spaghetti piles, look for the good stuff too. Like, hey, who knew that cool thing was happening? I didn't know there was like, those people had a great partnership going on over there. Nifty, let's elevate that, let's lift that up. And then just being patient. Change takes time, it changes an emotional process, unlearning and learning. Um, some closing thoughts, um, you know, thinking about your ecosystems um, uh, for your students. Your <laughs> wow, I haven't given a talk without my cat in it in a couple of years now. So uh, <laughs> Kevin was dropping in to say hi. Um, <laughs> hi, Kevin. Um, I'll be home later. Um, he's very interested in higher ed now in ways he didn't used to be. Um, so examining your ecosystems, thinking about where your students are, where you all are, um, being good partners, right? Like that's just like, that's just, that's just good human advice, right? But like being good partners across staff in academic advising, institutional research, financial aid, student affairs, faculty development, you are here, um, faculty instructors, health and wellness, like just be good partners, show up for each other. I think that's really important. Um, and then process map and design with empathy around students. You know, you're gonna scale empathy up. I think that's another kind of way of facilitating that removing the silos, taking down the low bridges got to be brave. No guts, no glory. This takes courage. This takes a little extra effort. Um, it is easier to not put yourself out there, um, but the rewards are really high for this work. So I would love to take questions, um, hear what you have to say. Um, folks who are on Zoom, um, we don't actually have a question um, way for you to send them to us, uh, but people who are here in the room hopefully will raise the issues you're interested in. Thank you so much. <laughs>